Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. Disturbing clots are impeding the flow of blood in New York's most important artery, its mass transit system. As subway ridership steadily grows, the quality of the ride declines. Massive overcrowding, frequent equipment failures, and delays that have doubled in the past five years. Bus ridership is falling because the service is slow and unreliable. How is the MTA coping? Perhaps the best person to answer that is the man who saved New York's mass transit system from complete collapse in the dark days of the early 80s. Former MTA chairman, the always candid Richard Ravitch, is next. Richard Ravitch, good to see you again. Very good to see you. Y you did a few other important things in your public life, well, small things like help save the city in the fiscal <laughs> crisis in the 70s. Uh, you led the Charter Revision Commission. You've built public housing. But uh, let's, put on your, let's put on your mass transit hat for today. What's the MTA doing well, and what is it doing poorly? Well, you know, I, I have some hesitation in being judgmental about the MTA itself because you, you never know what happens in a complex organization uh, unless you're involved in it. All right. But I did have a very high regard for Tom Prendergast, who just left as chairman. Mm -hmm. He was a very able guy. I knew him when he was uh, head of Long Island Railroad. He was a superbly qualified professional person. Uh, and I have no doubt there's a dedicated, wonderful staff at the MTA. I think the problem uh, is the fact that ridership's going up, population of the city's going up, the dependency on public transportation is increasing significantly, and it was always obvious that it was key. What is different is that the relative investment in the infrastructure of the MTA is way off of what it used to be because there is no serious involvement anymore by the business community uh, or even the labor movement collectively in addressing this most fundamental issue because it costs a hell of a lot of money and it means more taxes or more tolls and politicians don't like that. What, uh, how, are the, how are the, is the business community and, and the others uh, not Well, when uh, I was chairman and I sought a lot of tax revenues and uh, to support the capital program for the MTA. Well, you, you uh, came up with the first capital program, $55 billion. Yes, dollars, and but it was, there was a reluctance on the part of the Republicans to support the increase in taxes that I had suggested in order to fund the borrowing necessary to provide the capital. And it was David Rockefeller and Dick Shin and Walter Riston and Bill Ellinghouse, the leaders of our major corporations, who understood that the well-being of the subway system was critical to the well-being of New York City and indeed the value of the real estate that they owned and occupied was affected by the well-being of the transportation system. And they went to Albany, whether literally or telephonically as immaterial, and they said, approve this tax package, approve these taxes. In 2008, when the governor asked me, that's years after I left, when the MTA was once again strapped for capital, and the then governor said to me, would you chair a commission and put together a plan? I went right to the business community, and I said, we need revenue. Here's a list of possible revenues that would support the borrowing necessary to provide the capital the MTA needs. I said a gas tax, payroll tax, listed a whole bunch of taxes. I said, which tax will have the least injurious impact on the economy of New York? And they said the payroll tax. So, And you built the five-year plan, as I recall, on a 1% 
on a one, well, the, the original back in 79, 80, 81, right. 81, you built it on a 1% uh, payroll tax, I think. Well, on gas taxes, whole, well, there were a whole package right. of taxes that we used to support the borrowing necessary. But we also, for the first time, I got a law passed that permitted the fare box revenues, the tolls to support the capital borrowing of the MPA mm -hmm. as well. So the capital plan, the last capital plan of the MTA, which was approved, I think, close to two years ago in the neighborhood of $29 billion, very little of it's actually funded. Yeah. Well, I want to go into some of that. I, 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 I'm intrigued by this idea that, you know, the wrangling the business community. I mean, it's so obvious, but somebody's got to do it, that business doesn't survive in this city without the subway and bus system. And as you point out, the real estate that they own and have developed and intend to develop more is worthless without this. So who is falling down on the job, not, not well, getting these people into the same room, the, the business leaders of today into the room and saying, guys, this system needs more money and it's in your best interest to help us find it. I don't know who is. I'm not aware that anyone is, and that's my problem. Well, it's a big problem. Nor, nor am I aware of any initiative they're taking themselves. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, again, I mean, this is an issue of money, and let's talk about what I think is some of the funny money in the capital plan. You, as you said, it may be $29 billion, but that's the... <laughs> That number doesn't really mean much when it's not funded. And, you know, there's this, uh, for instance, this year, the governor, Governor Cuomo's budget authorizes a, a billion and a half, but only 640 million of that is actually authorized to be spent. Also, the governor is saying state funds are going to be the last in. You've got to use up everything else before we come on board with our money. I mean... I, What's what's the governor doing? I mean, he's, isn't he supposed to be the major champion of this organization? Uh, I think he should be. I think that his view about the governance of the MTA is very different from the view that Governor Hugh Carey had. Uh, he believes that the executive branch of the state government should run the MTA, not a truly independent board. Mm. Um, and, you mean this governor? Yes. Yeah. And um, I think that the mayor has failed to use the bully pulpit of being the mayor to create any pressure, uh, political and public pressure, to fund the MTA. Been very silent and passive about it. Um, and uh, I think the governor undoubtedly believes in infrastructure investment, but we have to wait and see whether he's prepared to support the taxes or the tolls or the fare increases necessary to provide the revenue that would support the amount of capital that has to be borrowed to restore the system. Looking at, at, uh, at the governor's budget, uh, what, I'm, what I'm calling funny money in, involving the MTA, uh, back five or six years ago, the governor said, uh, made a promise that the reduction of the payroll tax, which was uh, instituted uh, and, of course, cost the MTA, he said he promised that he would make that up dollar for dollar. Well, this year, dollar for dollar seems to have disappeared because now he's only going to partially make that up. He's cut $65 million. So just another example of, I don't know what to call it. What would you call it? I, well, I'm not familiar with that specific, but, but um, the, the, the three basis point uh, payroll tax that I recommended in 2008 that was created is still on the books. The Republicans modified it a bit uh, to remove the obligation to pay from school districts, and they made a big issue out of it in the politics of some legislative elections in Long Island 
Uh, but that's still on the books, and it provides probably somewhere between a billion three and a billion five of revenue that supports the MTA capital plan. Um, and when it was enacted, nobody said the going to drive people out of New York because we have a three basis point tax on payrolls. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but the the question is, what are the needs? Are we, is this even the question of whether this 29 billion is enough? You take, for example, I waited the other day on 86th Street, Lexington Avenue subway station. Two trains went by because. Full. Full. Sure. I now, buy that line a lot. I know, what you, I know what you're talking about. Now, you know, the headway. Between the, the time between trains, yeah. Is a function of the signal system. Signal system was built when the subway system was built in the beginning of the last century. Yeah, it's 100 and what, 10, 12 years if old. If they went to a voice control system, they could move, I forget the exact percentage, but at least 50% more trains through a particular station in the same period of time. And that is only that very expensive, a big change. Um, there's a little money, as I understand it, in the capital plan to start that. But if you really want to make the system work better, you got to do that. You know, everybody is excited about the Second Avenue subway. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, it's three beautiful stations. Beautiful three stations. <laughs> but when it was first conceptualized, the, the chief argument for it, was to bring it up to the East Bronx, to open up the East Bronx, because if you look at the history of New York City, real estate development, and therefore property values, and therefore property taxes, which were the chief revenue for the city of New York, they followed the construction of the subway system. Brooklyn, Queens, starting, of course, with Manhattan. It was also so, supposed to go south to the Lower East Side. It, yes, uh, the Lower East Side is not under subway, let me put it this way. No. Um, compared to the East Bronx. Um, not by the a lot. potential for the development of, of commercial, of economically viable uh, development in the Bronx would have followed a construction of the subway system. It's still part of the plan to go there eventually, but uh, um, it's going to be a not in our lifetime. Not in our <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> well, uh, let's go to the other piece of this, or and no other piece of this. You talked. You've made very important points about the 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 need for money and the what appears to you to be the lack of political will and uh, government will and business will to make it happen. Then there are those who would criticize the MTA as not, you know, not being able to spend the money it gets wisely. Um, uh, it, yeah, some some uh, examples, and these I would think go to rider confidence in this in this organization. Uh, I was reading recently about the elevators and the escalators failing, and. Um, all right, so they're operating 24 hours a day. You expect that they're going to be failures, but the failures are up. But what caught my eye in the story is that the MTA is still working on machinery, elevator and escalator machinery, in the 2014 cap, uh, the, the, the capital plan before this one. They haven't even finished that work yet. And, you know, we're into a new... Uh, we're into a new era of, of capital funding. In other words... People look at that and they say they can't, you know, this agency can't really manage itself in some examples. Um, and so if you give it this money, are they going to be able to, to manage the projects that they're going to take on? Tony, it's perhaps unfair of me to comment since I don't know the people anymore who uh, professionally run it. But as I said to you, I had a lot of confidence in Tom Prendergast. Yeah. And... I think he brought a lot of talent into that agency. And I know uh, the chief financial officer is a very able guy. And the guy in charge of the capital program, I think, is a very able guy. I can't comment 
Uh, you know, sometimes I'm not asking you to be critical these of these delays occur uh, not because of incompetence, but because of inadequate resources, inadequate approvals by the board or the second floor in Albany of particular things. There's a lot of um, uh, communication between the second floor in Albany. I'm Governor's told, office, you're talking about. Yes. Uh, the, the, certainly there was in my day. Yeah. Um, as they say on Wall Street, if you're the MTA, the trend is not your friend. You talked about the, the overcrowding and the need to, you know, trains have to go by because they're too full. The delays uh, <clears throat> have doubled in the past five years. Uh, bus ridership is down 16% in the, in the past uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, what do you, how, if you were the MTA chairman right now, how do you deal with, let's take overcrowding. I mean, that seems to be the principal, uh, the principal uh, uh, complaint of, of riders who uh, might want to know that in January of this year, there were 60,000 delays in the subway system. Overcrowding was responsible for 25,000 of them. That seems to be the principal complaint. You mentioned, of course, we had a better signal system. It would alleviate this, but we're not going to have you a know, better the, signal the, system in our lifetime, became, perhaps. When I became chairman in 1979, and I lived on the west side of Manhattan, I took the subway to my business office every day. I'd taken the subway to school since I was 10 years old. Um, uh, so I knew the subway system pretty well. My grandparents lived in Brooklyn. I went out there yeah. on the weekend on the subway. Um, and I visually saw the deterioration. When the governor first asked me to be chairman, I said, Hugh, you don't ride the subway. I do. You're crazy. <laughs> um, the first thing I did was I asked the engineers, the technical people at the MDA, to give me a report that showed what the useful life of every component part of the system that is track, uh, the power cars. lines, the cars, to, tell, to do a report and tell me what the useful life was and what the replacement cost was. And it came to the conclusion that they took them five months to do that study. Mm -hmm. They were grateful. Nobody had ever asked them before. They had always been told, you got X dollars. How are you going to spend it? And what the needs were far in excess of the amount of capital that was available. Far in excess. What do we do? Uh, I wrote a report. Nobody liked it because it required a lot of money. And many either capital appropriations by the legislature or by the city of New York. Um, or the creation of revenues that would support power. And nothing happened until the Daily News and the New York Times wrote full-page editorials mm -hmm. saying to the politicians, pay attention, we have to fix the public transportation system. And then Hugh Carey, Warren Anderson, who was the Republican majority leader, and Stanley Fink, who was the speaker of the assembly, they got together and we negotiated a capital plan, gave the MTA for the first time in its history the power to borrow money, which meant that the fares were going to go up. And when politicians said to me, you're going to raise the fares, I said, you got a choice. Either we raise the fare and fix the system, or the system will become dysfunctional within five years. So, and the politicians had to make a tough choice, and they made the right one. It's, uh, you present a fascinating picture, because earlier you talked about the, uh, the ability of a governor or the interest, the, the activity, the involvement of a governor and a mayor, and you're seeing um, less, perhaps, than you'd like to see uh, from them and other politicians. 
and the business community, uh, which, as you pointed out, listing some of the hallowed names, uh, got on board back then and, and forced action. So we don't have that level of commitment from the governor, from the mayor, from the politicians, from the business community. How do we get, is it, is it time for the editorial boards of these newspapers to wake up and say, guys, uh, well, Rome is burning. Tony Guida and CUNY TV is a good beginning. <laughs> well, let's hope, let's hope so, but... Um, I, I, can I tell you a story? I just received an invitation to a memorial service for David Rockefeller in the mail yesterday, in right. a week or so. In 1982, when I could not get the Republicans in the New York State Senate to move on my capital plan, I called David Rockefeller on the phone. Now, the ravages didn't exactly hobnob with the Rockefellers, <laughs> but he took my phone call. And I said, Mr. Rockefeller, this is an audacious request. Would you be willing to get up at 5 o'clock one morning and let me show you the interstices of the New York City subway system? And he said he'd be glad to. Hmm. And I had a transit police car pick him up. And after he agreed, I asked him if he would call the head of... Uh, AT&T and they had a met life, which he did, and they came along as well. And I took them to the uh, 207th Street Yards, which is mm. where the independent I'm familiar, very system. familiar with them. And I took them to the end of the number six line, showed them, uh, and the command center, which was then underneath Grand Central, it's now on the west side of Manhattan. And I showed them the conditions under which the men worked, the empty inventory shelves. And I don't know what they said to Warren Anderson and to the Republicans, but all I know is in the next couple of weeks, they approved everything. Uh, that. Uh, Are you available to uh, <laughs> come back? And You know, you were many times in your career, uh, at least some of the newspapers would call you Mr. Fix-It, the man that they, the, the politician... Pejorative phrase, isn't it, but, uh, well, Mr. Fix-It? It, it was meant in a, in a very <laughs> complimentary sense that, you know, if you had a problem that you couldn't get resolved, call Dick Ravitch and he'll figure it out. I'm just wondering if, if you're available. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about a couple of other things that might help the system. Uh, is it time for the Metro card to be retired in favor of some kind of a tap and go, you know, something like London, the Oyster, you know, you just get on the train or get on the bus and just tap the thing with your wallet or your card instead of this, you know, what we've got. I, I don't have an intelligent answer to that question. I haven't thought about it. I, uh, I have my card. I don't find it a burden to No, stick not it at all. Sometimes I turn it the wrong way and have right. to do it twice. But. Uh, what about the idea, and they're, apparently they're working on it a little, extending the seven line to, um, I guess, Hoboken, New Jersey. Is that a, is that a development idea? Is well, that a, actually, what's the need for that, do you think? Tony, there, there is a need to take a fresh look at the whole region's transportation system, uh, particularly now since we may get in, uh, some infrastructure funding from Washington. We don't know yet. Um, and we have serious issues with Amtrak, which is not funded adequately either, and some uncertainty about the the third tunnel, mm -hmm. um, and we, these systems were not appropriately integrated. There was no compelling reason to do it, perhaps in the past, yeah. compared to other needs. But now with the growth of the po population, looking at the transportation system from a regional point of view is more compelling than ever. And that requires a, 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 a a governor uh, of both states who are willing to um, have the right professional people, a very public process of saying, what, what would we need to ensure the economic growth of this region from a transportation point of view? Well, it's, it's, and it'll come up with a staggering number, and then people can pare it down, and I, I'm not suggesting that everything should necessarily 
uh, come at once, but at least we need that that vision again. Well, you talk about two governors uh, uh, cooperating, and it's, you know, it's almost fresh in memory that the, one of the first things uh, Chris Christie did when he became governor of New Jersey back in, I think, 2008, but whatever it was, and it was almost like the first day of his term, he canceled the money for the third tunnel under the, the rail tunnel under the Hudson sure. River. He didn't it, want to raise the gas tax. Yeah, and he wanted to use that to fix up all the bridges and roads that were uh, falling down in New Jersey. And then he couldn't reduce the traffic enough to uh, uh, it, it, I mean, better. To, you know, I'm not an expert on this either, but it seemed like very short-term thinking. Uh, it, it, you know, casting aside a project that people, experts have said for years is is necessary because, <laughs> you know, with two, two rail tunnels under the Hudson River carrying Amtrak and, and New Jersey Transit or whatever else, uh, one of them goes down and they're old and they need, they need refurbishing. We're in huge trouble. Well, I think we have to re-examine what happens at Penn Station. And I think we need perhaps another, another track, uh, uh, another access point for rail in a block uh, to the south of Penn Station. There are a lot of very creative people thinking about this. Um, it's time really that maybe when we get a new governor of New Jersey, likely to be a very able guy, Phil Murphy, right now he would appear to be the winner. Um, uh, it's an early endorsement. Uh, and maybe uh, he and, and Governor Cuomo might get together and say, we have to look at this whole regional transportation network. How, how uh, well, you mentioned Washington. What do you think is the, the future of mass transit funding under a Trump administration? Can, can, you a, can you even guess? Can you hazard a guess? I, I could not guess. Right. No idea whatsoever. I think that um, if they talk a lot about private investment, I think that's nonsense. You don't have private ownership of a subway system. You don't finance public transportation with taxable bonds, if you can finance it with tax-exempt bonds, one right. would produce a much higher fare or toll. Uh, it's all kind of silly, so I have no idea what's going to come out of there. But I do remind you that Jimmy Carter proposed a three-cent increase to the gas tax in 79, and it never got out of committee. And when Ronald Reagan got elected president, he proposed a five-cent increase in the gas tax, one penny of which was to go to mass transit. It, it was the largest infusion of federal money ever into public transportation. And because I was chairman of the MTA, I was invited to the bill signing at the White House. And a reporter asked Reagan, Mr. President, how could you have a five cent increase in the gas tax having gotten elected on a platform of no new taxes? President Reagan looked at the reporter and stuck his finger out and said, it's not a tax, it's a user charge. Mm. And the New York Times reported, President Reagan is proposing a five cent user charge. <laughs> but it was the largest in fear. But he put lipstick on the pig. And right. maybe that's the way to handle this. <laughs> yes. Well, Dick Ravage, it's great to see you. I, I can't help uh, thinking, sitting here and listening to your prescriptions, that we need somebody like you to get these people into a room and focus on this system, which, after all, is our lifeblood. But thank you for your time. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Thank you for raising the subject. All right. And we will see you next week.